Hello. So can you hear us? I realize that I've been speaking very, I apologize, but it's the microphone. Can you hear us? Yes. I, I, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Good to be with you. Hello, how are you? Will you introduce yourself for the tribunal briefly, please? Yes, I'd be delighted. Uh, I am uh, Joel Simon. I'm the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, before joining CPJ, which was a very long time ago, uh, I was a journalist for uh, over a decade in Latin America. Joel, I think that we would love to hear and give you the opportunity to talk about the work, specifically the organization that you helped to fund and, and, and direct and the work at CPJ in, in protecting <clears throat> journalists, but also, frankly, on, on the work that you have been conducting on uh, gathering data about the, the situation of the journalists, about the attacks on journalism, and, and yeah, please expand as, as much as you need of, of that word. It's important, particularly to the fight against impunity. Yes, I, 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 uh, I think data is crucial, and we've seen um, already in the testimony that's been provided uh, that uh, data is sort of at the heart of uh, the argument that we are making about the risk to uh, press freedom and the way that the impunity and the killing of some journalists undermines uh, the broader protections that exist for free expression and the right to know. Um, I do want to correct one small point. I didn't uh, help found uh, CPJ. It was created in uh, uh, 1981, which uh, I was in uh, high school at that time. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I've been here for for for. Uh, uh, 24 years. I've been executive director for 15. Uh, this is the, my last few months uh, in the role. Uh, I will be leaving CPJ at the end of the year and taking up a fellowship uh, at Columbia. Uh, regarding the data, one of the things that uh, CPJ uh, as an organization of journalists uh, that we've always prided ourselves in doing is uh, researching and documenting uh, violations of press freedom and specific attacks against uh, journalists around the world. Uh, that process started not long after we were founded, uh, and we have comprehensive data uh, uh, about the killings of journalists going back to uh, 1992. Uh, in 2004, when the issue of impunity first emerged on the international agenda, uh, this was in response to an initiative uh, that a, a, another group, the Inter-American Press Association, had undertaken in Latin, in Latin America, where the murders of journalists were rampant and official protection uh, for criminal organizations had uh, undermined uh, and thwarted investigations into those killings. Uh, the Inter-American Press Association developed a impunity campaign where they deployed investigators, investigated crimes, and uh, sought to put pressure on uh, governments uh, to bring the perpetrators of these crimes to justice. And we at CPJ uh, realized that we were sitting on a, uh, a trove of data uh, that could cast, uh, put, put the murders of journalists into a global context. And so we undertook with a team of researchers to go back through that data, looking at the period from 1992 uh, to um, uh, 2006, and we created um, something we call uh, the uh, impunity index. And this was a means of measuring uh, the not just the rate of, in, of murders, which was something we'd already been doing, but the ability of governments to solve these murders and bring uh, the perpetrators to justice. I actually remember having a meeting with a government official who said, you know, we, what, what do you expect us to do? We have all these murders. How are we going to measure progress? And I realized that we didn't have a way of doing that. So the, the, the framework for the impunity index was that we would hold governments accountable, not just for the killings of journalists, but for their own responsibility to investigate these crimes and bring the perpetrators to justice. And we created a structure. We looked at a 10-year period because that was a period during which we thought we might be able to, to uh, carry out effective advocacy. And we developed a, a score or a rating uh, based on the 
specific population of that country. And we ranked the countries in terms of the worst countries for prosecuting the killers of journalists uh, to ones that had a slightly better record. And we use this impunity index uh, to incentivize governments to investigate and solve these murders and uh, improve their record. One of the data points that you've heard mentioned over and over today is that 90 percent of these cases, uh, the murders of journalists, uh, the killers get away with it and the crimes go unpunished. That was data that was developed and, and made public as a result of this exercise in analyzing CPJ's data and developing the impunity index. The number has come down slightly over the 15 years that we've had this impunity index. Uh, it's, it's in the low 80s now, but clearly uh, very little limited progress has been made. The issue of impunity remains uh, entrenched um, governments have demonstrated a lack of political will in terms of uh, resolving these cases. And the consequence is that the global flow of information is undermined, that critical investigative journalism is thwarted, that leading journalists, irreplaceable journalists are being murdered, and the murders of these journalists are not being brought to justice. So there is, a, there is an environment in which uh, censorship is accomplished uh, through murder. I was asked actually, Joe, thank you for the correction before too. That was my next question. And, and what impact do you think this impunity index have in practical terms? You, you talk about reducing a little bit the rate ratio of, of or the percentage, better said. But it is any other, um, is, the, is the name and shame had any, any impact at all? Or you just, could you identify any other effects? Well, I think it has had, a, had an impact because uh, one of the impacts is, uh, frankly, that we're, we're, we're here today uh, talking about this and that there's a people's tribunal and that there's international awareness and that you've been able to bring uh, such a significant uh, uh, range of experts and, 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 and advocates who have been working in this area. You know, I do think that the, the understanding that, you know, uh, just how grave and significant this problem was, that 90% of, uh, uh, of, of mur the murders of, in 90% of the cases, at least when we initially created the impunity index, the killers got away uh, with the crime, uh, was so shocking uh, and such a clear uh, and fundamental threat to press freedom that it did uh, galvanize an international uh, response. And uh, I know that you've talked about the various uh, UN resolutions and mechanisms and structures that have been created as, as a result. I think the question is really, you know, that, and the challenge rather, is that this issue is so clearly on the international agenda, and yet there has been almost no progress or very limited progress. And so I think that's really the question that we are grappling with now. Why is it that 15 years after acknowledging and recognizing the scope of the problem and committing resources to addressing it, that so little has changed? And while there are many complex reasons for that, I think the most fundamental one is the lack of political will. Irene Khan talked about something that we verified as well, which is that most of these crimes, or many of them anyway, involve the nexus of organized crime and official protection. Some of the journalists referenced uh, in today's testimony, uh, Anna Polakovskaya, for example, uh, I would uh, mention uh, uh, Carlos Cardoso in uh, Mozambique, uh, Javier Valdez in Mexico, uh, Daphne Caruana Galicia in Malta. There are so many examples of journalists who have been murdered in reprisal uh, for this kind of uh, reporting. And the uh, obvious challenge here is that when journalists are killed uh, for exposing this nexus of official protection, with organized crime, the state itself is not incentivized to solve the crime. To the contrary, the state and the resources of the state may be mobilized to participate in the cover-up of the crime. And 
breaking through that lack of political will is an enormous challenge and requires the focused and consistent uh, efforts by the international community, by uh, domestic advocacy groups, by the media community. And uh, it is, there are some examples, but it is, it is breaking through uh, that uh, resistance to carrying out a, a, a serious investigation is enormously challenging. And, and I would like to make one other point just in, in reference to the journalists that, that, that I mentioned, some of them, which is that anytime a journalist is murdered, and the killers are not brought to justice. It is, it is, it is, it is censorship by murder, and it is a threat to uh, local communities, to the, to the, to to inform societies at the national level, and to global understanding. Because um, to uh, because censorship anywhere is censorship everywhere. To reference uh, Lee Bollinger, the, the president of Columbia University, who has been a key. Uh, 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 proponent uh, of global uh, free expression. So what's what what happens though is when these specific journalists, I call them vanguard journalists, who have unique skills, investigatory capacity, reach something that distinguishes them in a profound way from the rest of the media community. When these journalists are killed, they are irreplaceable. There is no one who can step forward and do carry out these kinds of investigations. And so when you have a high level of impunity, it actually creates an environment in which those who are um, predisposed to use violence are incentivized to do so because they understand that they will be permanently silencing an irreplaceable voice and that given the current climate, there is very little possibility that they will be brought to justice. And so this is one of the fundamental challenges we face in standing up and protecting the rights of journalists and bringing the killers of journalists to justice and in creating a global environment in which, again, to uh, make reference to Irene Khan's testimony, in which journalists are free to carry out their work and uh, do not face violent consequences uh, as a result. Joel, the last question from my side will be, as do you, and as a consequence of the impunity uh, index and all the investigation work that you guys engage, as to get more information on, on the causes and obviously exposed it, and, and automatically, I suppose, demanding more from the state as you relate right now, what role play in your opinion, the big newspapers, traditional outlets, mm. TV station, the, the, the news anchors, the, those places where some of these unique and perhaps less exceptional freelancing journalists, but their house or their stories revert. What, what are the role and what can we expect from them on accountability? Well, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that while in, in, impunity is deeply entrenched, one thing that the impunity index revealed is that there are a handful of countries, uh, you know, perhaps around a dozen, uh, that uh, represent uh, the, 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 the most intractable places where, where impunity is a persistent uh, problem and where uh, this creates an environment in which journalists are, 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 are unable uh, to uh, carry out their their normal function without um, fear of, of of being murdered. Um, I think that the media community has a has a, a a number of responsibilities. I mean, first is to the individual journalists that uh, they employ. One of the things that our data illustrate is that in forty percent of all uh, murders of journalists, uh, there's a threat that precedes the murder. And what that means is that these murders are generally organized plots and that the, that the journalist has some awareness that there is a plot against them, but the journalist doesn't often have the ability to assess the threat or take uh, action to protect themselves. They do not have the support of the state. They do not have, as again, as Irene Khan, the, the, the means to leave the country if that's a possibility and go somewhere where uh, on a temporary basis because they can't access visas. Uh, so 
Uh, they are incredibly vulnerable, and the media community has a responsibility to the journalists that they employ or to journalists that are part of the profession to support journalists who are who face these kinds of threats and ensure uh, that the threats are not uh, carried out. Um, I also think that the media community and and has 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 done a reasonably good job and should consider con continue to do this of raising public awareness. It really makes an enormous difference in the ability to pursue justice. I think that when where there is some modicum of justice, a number of things happen. One is the media community gets behind uh, the you know uh, fight for justice and publicizes it and engages the public. The second is that there is a committed family member or an editor or an advocate or some individual who is who is can personalize and and individualize the fight for justice. We I know we heard from um, uh, Katija Chengiz, and she's certainly playing that role uh, in fighting for uh, uh, justice in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And I and I would point out that the media community. Uh, in the Khashoggi murder, particularly the Washington Post, which employed uh, Jamal uh, Khashoggi as a columnist, um, has also played a critical role uh, in raising awareness, in uh, speaking out, in engaging the public, in engaging officials, in applying consistent pressure. I think that response has been uh, exemplary, frankly, but I think it's relatively rare. And I think that while journalists uh, and media organizations are wary of special pleading, of a sense uh, that uh, they are uh, engaging in activities that serve their own interests rather than the public interests, I think in this instance, the interests of the media community or even of a specific media organization and the public interest clearly converge. And if, if journalists are uh, killed with impunity, then the public is less informed. So the media community coming together, standing shoulder to shoulder, speaking out when their colleagues are killed, covering those, those investigations, reporting on uh, small developments, um, pressuring government officials, engaging with the international community, rallying support, all of that is consistent with the role of the media and is something we should uh, expect and demand uh, whenever journalists are murdered. Thank you very much, Joel. And do you have anything else to add? Um, we then thank you very much. Thank you so much for this opportunity.